So you do not have notes because I follow the book, I'm following the book uh, rather closely, and you can uh, just apply these principles. There was an outline given as to uh, some homework, uh, Matt compiled that. But today's subject is the focus on the Old Testament narrative, okay? Focus on Old Testament narrative. Now, these principles apply to any narrative for that matter, but we're applying them particularly to the scripture, and then they carry over into the New Testament narrative, because just remember there's narrative in the New Testament. Narrative meaning story, his, his story. So you see it in the Gospels, you see it in the book of Acts, you see it in other sections. So um, we, we want to emphasize that, but uh, in your book, there's this, a chapter on Acts and then the Gospels, and we're going to deal with those in consequent lectures, all right? But primarily this, this afternoon, we're going to deal with Old Testament narrative. So here again, your, your primary resource is how to read the Bible for all it's worth, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. We have copies of it if you still need it. Those who listen online, I highly recommend that you buy this. It's worth uh, your effort. The principles that I will talk about, most of them, again, come from this book, and I will make a few direct quotations to give it its lawful copyright. But I also have derived some of this lecture for, in my opinion, the greatest book ever written on methodical Bible study. Robert Trainer, uh, Met methodical Bible study, good old Methodist from the 1950s. I used this in Bible college. It is excellent, okay? And I highly encourage you to consider getting a copy. Um, if you, you doubt it, you can ask Ethan. I gave him a copy. I don't know if he started to wrestle with it yet or not. But it's written in such a way that even those who enter in in a primary level of language study, whether it's Greek or Hebrew, it's English, etc., you can understand it. So here again, I recommend that. The fact that the book is still in print is another just commendation of its worth. So the lecture objective today is to help to clarify some of the principles from your text. This is your text, How to Read the Bible, for all it's worth. As I mentioned that before, uh, Fee and Stewart, I hope those who have a copy have read it already in preparation for this lecture. Uh, if you have not, I encourage you to be prepared for these lectures by already studying the material and, and then after the lecture, studying again and beginning to apply it. Some uh, homework has been given out, which is good, but you, you absolutely must read the text and begin to, to, to work with it, especially in this discipline. That's, that's, credit, that's just, just critical uh, because these principles have to be practiced, all right? So please, by all means, do that. The church has been gracious enough to purchase them for you. And here's the deal on this discipline, the discipline of hermeneutics and methodical Bible study is that you're learning to feed yourself, okay? When you sit under the pulpit ministry, you are, you are being fed by the pastor, and it's true, you're processing the information, and you should be processing it even with the principles that we have in here, but, it, but it's coming to you. He has already studied it and wrestled with it, and he's distilled it and he's given it to you. But the discipline of personal Bible study is dependent on you. It's dependent on you. It's dependent on you. Okay? It doesn't leave any room for a nonchalance, if I can encourage you in this. So the more, the more you work, the more benefit, and the, and the deeper you'll go. Okay? So I have had some formal education. So I... I'm somewhat tolerant in the Greek. My Hebrew is not the best. Uh, but it's, it's workable enough that when I study, I can include these disciplines in my study. But just studying in English is quite satisfactory. And there's plenty of tools available that once, once you get into this, you'll be able to access these tools without having to spend the time formally to learn these languages. But I also encourage you that as you're studying this discipline in particular and others, that you begin collecting other resources, okay? As I've mentioned, uh, this, this is the book that we're using. 
and just barely scratching the surface, if you can gather that. You know, what can you do in an hour with these themes? You could just give it a nick. But here you have the resource to go deeper, but there's hundreds of books written on the subject, and then I encourage you to be pursuing other resources. Pursu uh, I encourage you to be pursuing commentaries, Bible dictionaries, and may I emphasize, emphasize this in the hard copy. Okay, we were talking about that at Sunday school. There's a lot to that with the lay of the land politically. Let's just leave a sleeping dog lie there. So you, you should be gathering a library of sorts, okay? And I, I, don't wanna, I don't want you to say, well, you know, I drive a truck or I, I'm a construction worker. No, that's, no, that's not. <laughs> At the inception of my salvation, 1978, uh, I was a concrete finisher and still am to this day in one, one form or another, not much left of me, but I had started to accumulate a library. And it's absolutely essential for your intellectual growth as well as your spiritual growth. So let me just encourage you in that. All right, let's take a quick review. We've had two lectures already on the subject uh, that we're pursuing this morning, hermene or this afternoon, hermeneutics. So what is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. Now, that doesn't just mean interpretation of the scripture. It means interpretation of any literature, for that matter, because it's language. And I, I want to encourage you in that, that proper understanding of the scripture is not a passivity that says, well, I rely on the Holy Spirit to, to teach me the scriptures in a passive mode of thinking. If that was the case, then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, why was the Holy Spirit so scrupulous about using language and authors of a variety of circumstances? Because that, that's how we learn, right? Light and heat, light and heat. That's the old Puritan axiom for preaching, but it's also, in my opinion, the impetuous for disciplined study. So, but in our case, as we approach uh, hermeneutics, uh, we're using it to apply to the scriptures, the Bible. But we are then, we are then casting it into a method, all right? Into a method. If you, I, I want to drive that home, and, and I'll clarify that in a second. This is, this is methodical Bible study. So, so we come at it with a method of understanding language, all right? So when you're in Romans 6, 1, at, at the major structural junction of that book where justification has been just dealt with, and Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Meganoito, for those online who are scholars listening, I hope I said that right. But by no means. That's an emphasis in the Greek, but it translated into English. No, basically that idea. So, so there's where a, 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 just an understanding of language and pursuing it in that category along the meaning of word studies is absolutely helpful and very critical to our theology and our thinking. Now, here's the challenge. We've had two lessons already, good ones on hermeneutics, methodical Bible study, and you may feel disjointed at, that, at this point. Anybody feel disjointed? What I mean by disjointed is you have some principles floating around in reading the book as well as listening to the lectures, were quite good, but the normal temptation in this discipline, and I've been through it several times as far as teaching it, attempting to teach it, it's quite difficult to teach for that reason. So you may have a some, some disjointed principles floating around, oh, how, the outline is critical as Jonathan walked us through Romans. Structure is essential. As the book of Ephesians, the first part is positional truth. For one, Paul shifts gears and says, now this is the practical application of that. Context is absolutely essential in interpreting the scripture. So if you get into Corinthians and the head cover discussion, <laughs> you better remember context. And then there's other parts of it, lit literary techniques, all right? Well, is this a generalization, a particularization? Is this a climax like the book of Exodus? 
grammar, observation of grammar, uh, sentence structure, syntax. So as, as you're pursuing this, this stuff's floating around, okay? At least it was for me and still does to some point. So the, the purpose of methodical Bible study is to keep you from throwing up your hands and saying, yeah, 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 this sounds great. And you'll use maybe a word study principle, or maybe you'll, you'll, you got the idea of structure of a book, or you, or you as Jonathan so appropriately mentioned, you, you grasped onto outlines uh, and background. That's good. But, but we want to arrive at a method that in your mind you can approach different genres in a different way. As I mentioned, I spent, well, 45 years in one way or another in construction industry, not all the time, but my trade is concrete finishing. Okay, so when I first started finishing concrete at the age of 21, I put that edger in there and I was digging and I tried to float it and I just made a mess and I said, oh, I'm just gonna be a laborer, okay? I don't wanna deal with this stuff, it's too complex. But 45 years later, being around it, learning phase by phase, being around other people, understanding weather, understanding types of mixes, understanding what tool to use at what phase, I guess I'm a relatively good concrete finisher, right, Drush? At least we've always had groceries of one form or another. So I'm, I'm only using that to encourage you to say, this 45 years that I've been involved in this. So the concept of the methodical Bible study, you, you hear me keep using that word method, right? This, this has to be mature. But we have to refine the method, which we've started to do, according to the genre of literature. Genre is just a fancy word for the types of literature in the scripture, all right? There's different types there, isn't there? There certainly is. So there's narrative, which is history, which we're going to deal with today. There's prophecy, right? Revelation, all through the Old Testament. There's prophetic utterance. And uh, when we study prophecy, there's, the, there's distinctives of it that the way we enter in it, whether it's the law of double fulfillment or uh, it, the imagery, literal or non-literal in this circumstance, plugged into, particularly in the Old Testament, you can't study prophecy without studying the Deuteronomic Covenant. So these are part of the method, all right? Or, or the Gospels, which I will do, Lord willing, in August, and I'll pick up on some of the information that we won't cover from the narrative today. But... The harmony of the Gospels is absolutely essential to understanding the Gospels. Harmony meaning chronologically lining up the events. And you can see a harmony in any good study Bible. That's part of it. Or the parables. That's a distinct type of literature. Someone will do that. Uh, terms in the Gospels, etc. So what you hear? You see what I'm saying? We got different genres. You you will mature your understanding of the way you approach methodical Bible study, realizing, hey, this is a genre that, yes, I'm going to read it. Obviously, reading it is the door. It's just maturing your reading to learn how to go along these lines in different genre. You know, when you sit down to, to study an epistle, there, it's always work. But if you're going to preach on the book of Ephesians, you better go back to seventh grade class and remember... Uh, your teacher's instructions on diagramming. Remember diagramming, subject, verb, direct object, indirect object, the modifiers underneath, participles. That's absolutely essential in studying logical literature. And here again, uh, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it. Just basic, basic understanding. Poetry, when we delve into poetry, you're going to have to say, well, I, I know I need to understand what Hebrew parallelism is. So again, the point, the point, and, and I'm re, just reiterating what we've already done, is you're, you're getting a method to approach the scriptures. A method that understands language. And this isn't new, believe me. In fact, the 21st century, <laughs> I speak for myself, we need it. I don't know that folks needed it, those who could read two or three hundred years ago. 
because their education in this area was probably superior to ours, at least superior to mine. And that's humbling, but it's, it's probably true. So that's where we're at. Hermeneutics, science of interpretation, a, a method that understands language and literature, but it also has the mindset of looking, okay? Looking, look, 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 look. And I call this looking for snakes. When I lived in Africa, well, we had the three boys. Joshua wasn't with us, Ellie wasn't with us, Alva wasn't with us. But one of the things I learned early was to not be passive about the snakes. Mainly because there were cobras, and there were uh, black mambas, which are not very friendly, neither the cobras, and boon slangs, South African boon slangs. So as I lived there, more and more I learned to, okay, let me have a look at the wall. Let me have a look behind the outside freezer before I go to class. I taught in an institute there, because they had kitties playing in the yard. Let me take a quick look through the grass. Am I seeing anything? And then when I would get on the road in the bush, I'd start walking, and I'd always be looking. <laughs> I, I limp now, but I can remember one coming right between my legs, and it was a harmless one, but, but I jumped straight up in the air. Because, but I, I was ready for that. So that's this idea I want to ingrain in your thinking about methodical Bible study, that you are looking. It's not passive. Again, pre reception of preaching to some degree is passive, but you still have to process it. But here we're going in with an, an intent, just a, a direct intentional purpose. So... This, this puts us, and this is where this book is magisterial. I highly recommend it, this, this concept of observing, interpreting, correlating, applying. That's just for basic literature. Here again, i got to emphasize this. It's the Spirit of God that brings these truths home to the humble heart. But, but these principles, it, it's, just base, it's just to interpret basic literature. So when I say observe, what are we doing? We're, we're beginning to look at the text and we're, what are we observing? That's essential in the different genres, isn't it? Terms, structure, outline, argument, the importance of paragraph. Today as we'll get into narrative, character, narrator, scenes, plot development. That's, that's what we're observing. So then when we observe it, we, we, we interpret it, don't we? And who, what, when, where, why, how, we ask interpretive questions. And then when we get our answers, whether it's from our own understanding or, as I said, I'm a big fan of commentaries, Bible dictionaries. Yes, read the text for yourself initially, but then go to good commentaries, Bible dictionaries. I know when I studied Greek, they said, oh, no, don't you touch that analytical concordance. I said, there's no way. I, I can't get... We're not, it's not going to work. I need, I need the analytical concordance and I need the, uh, the, the, the parallel gospels in, in English and Greek. So, so I encourage that. And when you go through the interpretive step, then you put it all together and then you apply it. So, hey, you're studying Ephesians and you see the word redeem. You've observed this word. You say, wait a second. I'm observing this word. What does it mean? Well, then you're going to interpret it, aren't you? You're going to go to a Bible dictionary and you're going to say, hmm, uh, vines is good enough. And you say, well, here's ex agarazza. What does that mean? Well, it means to buy out. And once you interpret it, then you're going to correlate it. You're going to put it together and say, hey, wait a second. This is an essential theological truth that I've been bought out of sin. That's me. So I, I only give that to kind of tie things together as now we approach narrative that, that, that this is the process. So e each lesson, as you've noticed, has, has contributed to the method. Right? Contributed to the method. Just I, I, when I deliver, I used to deliver concrete too. <laughs> There's actually people, and I, I respect this, that thought you could just dump this stuff out of the truck and it would be a nice patio. I said, no, it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> there's, there's a method. Oh my, you have to rake it, you have to straight edge it, you have to bull float it. Then you gotta bull float it again. Then you gotta float the edges, then you gotta edge it. Then if you got some low spots, you gotta sprinkle it in. Then you can run a Fresno over it if you want. Then it depends on what kind of finish you want, see? But that was the method. And in our case here, now we are going to 
look into the method. So, uh, following a narrative, all right? And I'm going to define a narrative here. <clears throat> and here again, and most of this information coming one way or another from your book. In our case, it's the inspired biblical story, which is history, placed in the canon by the Spirit of God. So it's past events, all right? And we recognize it as legitimate history. Oh, no, you can't do that, you Bible thumpers. That's just mythical. I said, wait a second. So you're telling me that you're discrediting Moses as a historian? You're discrediting Luke as a bona fide historian? No, you can't do that. You can't, you can't just wipe it off just because you don't like what it says. So it fits definitely 40% or so, I think your book said, of the Old Testament, fits into the category of narrative. So that's absolutely essential. That's the way we approach it. Not only that, as we begin to think about these different narratives or stories, we're going to look at a few today. Uh, Joseph and his issue with his brothers being sold into Egypt. We're going to look at um, Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. We're going to look at the fall. They're, they're not just isolated, nice stories that you post pictures on down in the Sunday school room for the kids. They are our meta narrative. That's a key word. What, what's the, what's the meta narrative of the scripture? If this was uh, interactive, I'd ask that, but it's not. So I'm just going to tell you it. This is act, just this is our philosophy because everybody has a reality. Okay, we, this is our reality, and the people outside these walls they have a reality. They have something that shapes their reality. And we're saying this shapes our reality and the history, particularly in the Old Testament, contributes greatly to it because it's, it's part of the essential thread. So when I say meta-narrative, this is the whole picture of the scripture. So uh, page 95 of your book, the author quite appropriately gives out the three phases of meta-narrative. That's fine. Uh, my, my opinion here is the overall meta-narrative's meta creation, fall, promise, redemption, First coming, second coming, consummation. And you're, you're familiar with that. Uh, Answers in Genesis really works with, with this meta narrative quite well. It's not exactly what I'm pre presenting, but that's the overall picture, isn't it? When people say, well, what's the Bible about? In 30 seconds, I said, I just told you. Literal creation, literal fall, a, a promise of a redeemer. That redemption worked out through an old covenant people, new covenant church. Uh, first coming, second coming, consummation. That's what it's about. And then on, a, on a, a secondary level, we see it worked out through the covenant scripture, the covenant structure of scripture. Absolutely essential. Good preaching cannot neglect this, whether you're in reform camp or perhaps dispensational camp. E either way, good preaching cannot neglect the covenant structure of scripture, starting with the Adamic covenant. So it works itself out through then. Then it comes on another level. That's the individual level. That's the people involved. Joshua, Moses, Joseph. But then it applies to us as well. That's the meta-narrative. So whether it's what we're going to deal with today, the narrative or any of the other disciplines when you're studying an epistle or you're studying a parable, you're saying, how does it fit in the meta-narrative? Where, where does it plug in? Where's the unity of the scripture? Which is one of the prime defenses of the validity of why we accept the scripture as the inspired word of God is because of its unity. Jesus himself says this, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and it is these that bear witness of me. So he's the prime focus in the meta narrative, isn't he? But the author of Hebrews says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord. So you see that word eternal covenant. It's there. That's the thread of God's dealing with man. And depending on your persuasion and theology, you may interpret that a little bit different. But there's no question there's an eternal covenant. There's an agreement in the Godhead to redeem a people for themselves and then its appropriation to us. So that puts us now to uh, approaching some characteristics of, the, of this. But just remember, principle one, remember the meta-narrative as you study the scripture. That's essential in your method, the meta-narrative. What's the big picture? I often remember in my years of finishing concrete when the weather was not for us 
and we had our slabs laid out, and it was, who 80, 85, 90. No lunch today, boys. You better hustle. We just got to get this done and get it done right. That was our meta narrative <laughs> that all the essentials went into that. We got to finish this and get it done, or we get no check. So you always, again, back to what we're dealing with, our meta narrative is what I've said, and this is what we plug it in. So uh, let's look now at some characteristics uh, of a narrative. And here again, a reference to book, page 94, he de deals with this. So a narrative, a story, right? Obviously, we have characters, don't we? Yes, participants. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, some are just neither, but are participants in the story one way or another. And your book uses the term protagonist, antagonist, and uh, another term for those who are just, let's just say, not bystanders, but not necessarily the protagonist or the antagonist. Uh, there's, there's a plot, isn't there? Yeah, there's a, there's a storyline usually a tension to resolve. So as your book states in the case of Joseph, he was sold into slavery, right? Partially due to his, let's just say belligerence to some degree, but God meant it for good, right? Man meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And you know how the story works itself out. The plot develops and uh, his brothers eventually come down. They're, they're delivered, they re remain in Egypt. And then we know that the whole way it fits into the meta narrative is that the 12 tribes were preserved and the line of Judah was preserved. So that's very brief. We're going to study plot in a minute, but just, just to kind of wet your whistle a little bit uh, to realize how critical looking at the components are, all right? Just as if you were studying logical literature, if you were in the book of Ephesians and you're unwrapping the first chapter, you're, you're looking at the progression of the argument. Blessed be the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, right? So you say, oh, what are these spiritual blessings? And then you see a bunch of participles hanging. And, and you begin to say, well, here's the spiritual blessings. What are those in the Father? What are those in the Son? What are those in the Spirit? And then you're doing word studies with the terms, okay? So that's part of the method. But here, in a narrative, we're not so much concerned in that direction, although it doesn't discredit a logical progression, as you saw in your book, the rhythm of the narrative, but we're looking at the characteristics of it. Now, I'll read from the book here, uh, just directly, and I quote, page 94, in the biblical story, God is the protagonist. Satan, or opposing people powers, are the antagonists. And God's people are the agonists, okay? The basic plot of the biblical story is that the creator has created a people for his name in his own image, who as his image bearers were to be his stewards over the earth that he created for their benefit. But an enemy entered the picture who persuaded the people to bear his image instead and thus to become God's enemies. The plot resolution is the long story of redemption. End of quote. And here again, a reference to your book, that's page 94, last paragraph, and you can consult that later. But that, that sort of starts to show us what the, what the whole plot is. So you can, have, you can pick your Bible up and you can realize how many times the satanic forces tried to destroy the lineage of the Redeemer. Okay, you can see that time and time again. So, where are we at? All right, we, we, we're approaching this concept of narrative story. So yeah, there's some characters. Uh, there's a plot. There's a resolution of it. But now we're going to get a little bit more clear on these distinctives. But along the way, and I won't get to the end of the chapter, and there's a lot of helpful insights. I'll mention this at the end about cautions when you're looking at narrative. But uh, the author says that be careful of allegorizing. The creation account is not an allegory, all right? It's a narrative. It's a literal narrative. Despite what some of people who challenge us, it's not poetic literature, it's a narrative. Uh, an allegory is a, is a symbolic form of literature. So all you have to do is think about Chronicles of Narnia, right? That is an allegory, isn't it? Aslan is what? He is allegorical for Christ. So when we look at these narratives, whether Old Testament or New Testament, they're not allegorical. 
They are historical. They're real. That's essential. And then also the author quite appropriately points out that we, we have to be careful about over-moralizing out of narratives. Now, when I first read this, I said, yeah, I'm not sure I'd buy that. But the more I thought it through, I think he was correct. And he gave the uh, situation of David and Bathsheba. While it's true that adultery is wrong and it's heinous, that, that wasn't the prime, let's just say, impetuous of recording that narrative. I, I would say one of the prime ideas was the faithfulness of God in retaining the Davidic covenant that out of David's sin still came the line of the tribe of Judah, and he preserved his covenant people despite man's sinfulness, but there were human consequences, wasn't there? Yes, a divided kingdom. So with that in mind, now uh, just to remind you, principle two, uh, and uh, here again, you read your book before, after, drawing, read it so you can process this. When we're looking at a narrative, we're looking at characters. Uh, who? Who are they? We're looking at plot. What's going on? What's the resolution of the plot? How does it fit into the big meta narrative? So let's, un let's unpack the narrative. And again, uh, your, your book uses the story of Joseph, page 98. We'll make some allusion to that. But first, the author emphasized the idea of a narrator. And Moses is obviously the narrator of the Pentateuch, right? So we'll, we'll be doing, dealing in Genesis and Numbers. So he, he is the narrative, narrator, but he makes a very good point and says that the narrator is omniscient. He knows the whole story. Not, not, Moses is not omniscient in the sense of God. We're not saying that. Just saying that his view of the story was obviously what the Spirit of God had revealed to him. But in lieu of that, is very selective, wasn't it? So when a narrator records something, they're selective, aren't they? <laughs> so when your kids are scrapping, and you got A here and B here, and they're each explaining the, the incident, they're very selective, aren't they? Yes, generally speaking, it's very difficult to get them to come completely, let's just say, clean. Go back to the issue of the biblical narrative here, that the author is, uh, the narrator generally is very selective, comes from a specific point of view. Unapologetically, I emphasize that. So when you look at the creation narrative, which I, I believe that it's history, it's not poetic literature, you'll see God said it, won't you, quite a bit. I think that says a lot to at least substantiating my view of the account, that, that God said it. He spoke the worlds into existence, all right? So that's, that's the narrator's point of view there. The book gives you a good example of the narrator's point of view when we're dealing with Joseph being carried off into slavery. He says this repetitive clause, the Lord was with Joseph, is very critical. And the final meaning of the narrative, as, again, your book states, uh, he quotes uh, Genesis 50, 20, and as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order that about, bring about the present result to preserve many people alive. So first is the narrative. Ultimately, God's the narrative, right? That's correct, because we believe in the inspiration of Scripture. But the authors, then, are the narrator, narrators under Scripture. So it gives, it gives the perspective, right? That's our reality, isn't it? Yes, it is. We don't need to apologize for our view of reality. We don't need to be bashful of it either, because guess what? It's appointed unto a man wants to die after this, the judgment. So when people say, well, I'm not sure I agree with your view of reality, I say, well, wait a second, well, what's, what's, the, end of it? what's the end of the line? And our view has a good answer for that. It's called, I'm um, the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though we were dead, gets on the and so. Okay, so now the next aspect is, is the concept of a scene, right? Uh, and as your book says, this is the action moved along by as a series of scenes together. Uh, we'll just take a quick look at Genesis 11. And this will, uh, this is, as you know, the Tower of Babel here. And just to kind of wet your whistle again, to, to develop the idea of scenes, all right? So uh, chapter or verse 1 and 2, 
this is the scene of a united earth. Same language, settled in Shinar. All right, I won't take the time to read that for time's sake. So that, that's scene one. Well, what's scene two? Well, I will read this. Build, uh, and they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth, right? That's scene two. Scene three, uh, verse five through eight, God sees this and scatters them. And then scene four is a synopsis, okay? So up to this point, you, you've got this idea, all right, when I'm going to look at a, a narrative, there is a narrator, somebody telling the story, right? There are characters involved, some good, some bad, some either or or partially. There, there's a plot line, and that plot line is subservient to the whole biblical meta narrative, and I want to know how it fits in. So let's get a little more specific now. I, I've, I'm trying to give you just general thrusts of how to approach this and, and, and spoon feed you in it, not to offend you, but I need spoon fed myself in this. As much as I've studied for sermons over the years, my narrative skills, analysis skills were lipid. They weren't the best, okay? So that's why I'm coming in very, let's just say, basic, and then we'll mature. So when you look at a character, uh, what's, what's that character's status? A pauper or a king? And, and why, why would that be significant? You know, you have Joseph versus Potiphar. Well, just, just think about this in the narratives of the gospel, all right? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So here, here's a character <laughs> that is uh, completely humbled for our sake. And, and as you're doing your observation in, in a narrative there, you realize, wait a second, as I analyze this character, who, who this character is, it's quite sobering to our understanding of the whole plan of redemption, isn't it? Another aspect of these characters uh, is the relationship to each other, okay? So as you're looking at the narrative, particularly uh, let's refer to what the, the one the book looked at uh, in the end of Genesis 37 to 50, uh, Joseph and his brothers, uh, we have on one hand Joseph, who started out rather arrogant, but then was humbled, okay? And then quite, quite a contrast, his brothers. So you're, you're looking at each of the characters and then retaining this idea of comparing them. What, what were they like? And again, if you're going to study the kings, the narrative of the kings uh, in the Old Testament, whether, whether you start in Samuel, Kings, or go to Chronicles, this is very essential. In, in understanding the working out of who they are. So Manasseh is quite different than Josiah, isn't it? Very much so. And their, their relationship to the covenant is quite different as well. So that's second. But uh, sometimes ca characters are parallel as well. And uh, again, the book makes allusion to this, John the Baptist versus Elijah, all right? He, he was a fulfillment of Elijah, wasn't he? Yes. In that sense, conclusion of the last book of the Old Testament, and Jesus uh, de described that for us, that John the Baptist wasn't Elijah, but he was a fulfillment of that promise. So this is very critical characters. All right, let's look at them. Learn to look at them, all right? Shut your television off and read a book, all right? So that your mind learns to process the characters. How they change, okay? For example, Moses. Timid Moses in Exodus ends up a giant, doesn't he? Yes. Ends up a giant. He ends up the giant of the Old Testament. I don't know. You know, they said Winston Churchill was the greatest Englishman. You know, I don't know if he was or he wasn't. I have a lot of respect for him. But when I look at Moses and who he was, I realize the development 
the maturity of that character. And here again, that's another observation. Uh, the, the words or actions of these characters you want to pay close attention to because it fits into the meta narrative, doesn't it? And again, this is all in your book, all right? That's all in your book. So there's no excuse. It's all in your book. Joshua, right? What's, what's he say at the end of his book uh, as far as what he's, he's going to do? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's quite a statement. Because there, there's the guy that led them, uh, the great general Joshua, led them into the promised land. And now, now they're going to fight. And they are fighting. And they're displacing the Canaanites. And he makes a very pointed statement. He says, in lieu of the battle, me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And uh, quite frankly, by way of, of just a, a stepping aside, <laughs> that's a decision we have to make now, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, how about this other guy, uh, Phineas? All right, in Numbers, when Phineas, the son of Elijah, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from the midst of the congregation, took a spear, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through the body, so the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. And you know the circumstances of that. There's the action of Phineas. Plug it into the meta narrative, even before you interpret this narrative and say, okay, the hand of God was stayed against these people. So we've been looking at the narrator, characters, who they are. Uh, now, now dialogue, all right? This is, this is very important. The dialogue between one another. And um, this, this gives a, a definite clue to the plot, doesn't it? When you, when you start looking at the dialogue itself, it gives a clue to the plot. And we'll just for a minute here look at uh, the situation where Abraham was going to offer Isaac. And, and the dialogue there, right, chapter 22, verse 1, now came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Okay, so now, now you know how the dialogue uh, went. And God commands in verse 2, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I'll tell you. Critical, critical dialogue. Why? Because <laughs> it's, it's that end of story right there. If you're starting in Genesis, says, wait a second. This preacher told me to read right through the Bible, and, and I'm here, and it looks like it's the end of the line. And no, not at all. It, it fits right into the narrative, doesn't it? Because, uh, again, we're looking at dialogue. And uh, Abraham's son, Isaac, and Isaac spoke to Abraham and his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire of the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? For those of us who are preachers, <laughs> you can preach this one, can't you? If, you're, if, if your blood doesn't boil over Abraham's response, I don't know what to say. What's he say? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. That sets the tenor for the rest of the scripture, doesn't it? It made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Chapter 8, which I still, when I read that of John and uh, Jesus just basically says that, well, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad of it. And I'm thinking, Wow. To, to, what, to, to what degree did Abraham see it? So dialogue's critical. Uh, and then also there's, there's summary at the end of the section. You see that in uh, 22. Um, and then even cast, uh, contrasting dialogue. All right, you saw that there in chapter, or verse 10 through 12 uh, with Abraham and the angel of the Lord. So all these aspects of dialogue are critical. Here again, they're in your book, all right? All you got to do is read your book, they're there. Well, what about the plot? Uh, remember, plot, uh, major plot and its resolution. And we can, we can use this, this same incident here, the command to sacrifice, right? The, the obedience, and then the resolution. God provided the land. So, as you approach the narrative, right? This is what's going through your mind. Meta-narrative, big picture. 
I, thought, I submit to you that if you don't have a clear view of the medic narrative, you are, in many respects, robbing yourself of the value of biblical preaching. You're, you're getting tidbits. Now let, me, let me say that I believe that unequivocally. You sit down to a sermon or even read a text, if you don't see the whole picture and you're just looking at it from like a devotional part, which there's nothing wrong with that, <laughs> please plug it into the meta narrative. Plug it into the whole picture. And I think that you'll find food for your soul there. So the meta narrative, the narrator, different scenes, various characters, dialogue, a plot. Well, what do you do then? Do you, do you just walk away and say, well, that's nice? No, you end up with a synopsis, don't you? And what's a synopsis? It's a summary. Not just in the study of narrative, but even if you're going to epistolatory literature, all right? So you're talking about putting off the old man, putting on the new man. That's a contrast. That's the literary technique Paul uses there, isn't it? So you look at the characteristics of the old man, the qualities of the new man. You itemize them. You go through all that. You get into the theology of the new man, etc., etc., etc. But then at the end, you, you write a synopsis, don't you? A synopsis is a summary that, that helps you just categorize everything that's going on. And then you plug it into the meta narrative. Well, you say, well, you might be a bit jumbled at this point. Read your book. <laughs> the church spent the money to buy the books. Please read the book. Uh, so, why, why do you think that some preachers, and I'll try not to be biased here, or overjudgmental, but says, oh, I, I just do topical stuff. I, I don't do any exegetical stuff. Ex I don't do any expositional stuff. I just, just do, you know, I, I read through the scriptures and I, I just do a topic. Why? Jonathan, exegesis is work. When you sit down Tuesdays to study, you're, you're working, aren't you? Matt, you're working. You're wrestling. And as someone who has labored all my life, and just, uh, let's just say heavy labor, uh, it's much easier than sitting down and saying, okay, now I got to wrestle with this text in Hebrews. What's going on with these parenthetical warnings? And the mind just wrestles and struggles in your study. I'm not averse to topical sermons, but I would encourage you to have a flavor for exegetical sermons. We have six minutes left. We're going to apply these principles just quickly, okay? Not comprehensively. As I've said earlier, I'm only touching some of the principles mentioned in the book, okay? There's, there's some practical aspects in the latter part of the chapter dealing with interpretive helps. The concept of repetition, the concept of inclusion, the complex concept of implicit, explicit. And you, you can... You can wrestle with those. But let's, let's just spend the last six minutes here. Okay, let's go to the fall. That's a very critical narrative, isn't it? Uh, who's the narrator? Moses. Okay, what, what does he focus on? Think, think about it. What, what does he focus on in the fall? He focuses on the severity of it, doesn't he? Yes. I'll emphasize that. I'll put it up on the PowerPoint here. See it there? The severity of it. That there's no question that he introduces this with, wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Paul's words in Romans 5. So that's his point of view. It's not flipping. Again, it's not just, uh, you know, you get these pictures, you put them in Sunday school, which they're good. And some people just relegate it to that, and then as they grow up through the church, it, ne it never dawns on them the, the reality of, wait a second, this is what it is about. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. That's the narrative. Well, look at the scenes. Scene one is the serpent and the woman, right? 
the, the dialogue there, and we won't take the time to do that, but you can look at the dialogue. Scene two, the man and the woman eat. They defy, they defy the command of God. I believe this is literal. It's, it's not uh, mythological. Some in the church, quote unquote, today would say this is mythological. It really didn't happen. Just a prototype. I said, no, it happened because, in my opinion, the parallel uh, discussion in Romans 5 treats it like a literal event. And not only that, I live in the real world, and the soul that sins will die. So we have the scenes, the man eats, scene three, they're enlightened, right? And then as you follow through the rest of the discourse, you realize there's God's judgment on various figures, and then there's the proto-evangelical, as Matt was talking about this morning. Well, the characters, what kind of characters? Well, obviously God, perfectly good, and then we have Adam and Eve. What is it about, if you're analyzing a character here, though, what is it about Adam and Eve that you would want to really pick up here? Is they are in the pristine state yet, aren't they? They're in the state of innocence yet. See, this is where, you, when you look at a narrative, you really wrestle, you wrestle with the characters. But once they sin, what happens? They, they are now no longer in the state, per se, of innocence. And I'll be frank, I don't completely understand how they could have made this choice out of that state. I, I don't know that, but they did it. So that analysis of the character is absolutely critical to your theology. You, you will not... Maybe I shouldn't be so harsh, right, Trisha? <laughs> Let's just say you'll, you'll have trouble understanding Paul's and John's domain change, right? They're big on domain change, right? Christian life is not just about uh, adhering to some morals and then making a confession of faith. That's part of it, but there's, there is a domain change, isn't there? Death to life, darkness to light. And that's, that's where an analysis of characters is quite good. And once you pick this up with narrative, hey, and I'll admit, I'm, I'm just learning this myself. I learned a lot studying for this because my narrative skills were very poor. I have to admit that. But I learned a lot. But then look at the other entities, the serpent, right? And, and why? Why a serpent? You have all killed snakes, haven't you? Some degree, right? They don't kill easy, do they? You kill them and they keep striking, don't they? Yeah. Their, their reflexes, they keep striking. And boy, if there was an animal that manifests the, let's just say, character of Satan, it's, it's that, isn't it? Kill, killed at the cross, right? Keep striking. So here again, there, that's not allegory. That's just, in my opinion, common sense. I don't care for snakes. You probably shouldn't. Well, the black snakes, you can let them go, and the others. But again, having lived in Africa <laughs> and realizing that that snake is death right there. That boom slang is death. If that thing bites you, Keith, you're, you're not going to do well. <laughs> so there's analysis of character. And then dialogue, absolutely essential as you would read that and you would see the concourse of dialogue in between them. Particularly, for example, the distortion, right? The distortion of Satan's perspective, right? How he twisted the word of God. So there's the observation of character dialogue and you say, wait a second. That cer certainly applies to the rest of the scripture, doesn't it? And then you would arrive at a synopsis at the end because if you follow that through, you'd see there is a resolution, right? Genesis 3.15, right? As we were talking about this morning. That's, that's the, that's the proto-evangelic, right? That's the covenant that the whole scripture is built on. There's other principles in the book. I encourage you to read them. Uh, I encourage you to not get discouraged, all right? Because there's just the... Uh, temptation to say, you know what, this is a lot of work. People die for this book. <laughs> People give a year's wages for this book. 
I think that one of the prayers that we could pray is, God, help me not to be lazy, meaning me, you can pray what you want, and help me to, to, package, to package this and work at it so that I can approach it systematically. Because you notice that I've emphasized that our insight comes through knowledge, doesn't it? Our insight does not come through passivity. Passivity is dangerous. It's valuable if the passive mind is meditating on truth. But the empty passive mind is, is very dangerous. That's a discussion for another day. But again, I leave you uh, with an exhortation. There's many other good principles at the latter part of this, this chapter in the book. And in August, I think I'm scheduled to do Gospels. So I'm actually going to drop back and touch Acts a little bit. Because that's a narrative, and then we're going to look at the harmony of the Gospels.